Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We're joined by Stephen Wellman of Fresh Lime. Now, Stephen has a broader view, I believe, or we'll find out, of, of operations. So some guests we have come on are great. But they've just been in say sales operations for seven to ten years. But Stephen has he's had his own business. He's been working in much more broader kind of operations and strategy roles throughout his career. So I'm looking forward to diving into that. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, and with that inaccurate introduction, in that you you should be able to give us a more broader sense of how sales ops would fit into a into a growing B two B business. Yeah, yeah. I've I've had a few different experiences that have led me here really like you said i've owned um i owned a, a couple of small businesses um kind of floated around and done a few different things got it and so that leads us very nicely into the first question is how do you actually get into sales operations in the first place uh sure so um quite a few years ago um when i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do for my career i, I ended up in construction um, i did that for a little while ended up running um, a construction company and that led to me starting my own construction company which led to um, a few interesting opportunities um, but what I found is that was really physical um, I didn't really enjoy that but I liked the puzzle components of it taking a set of plans really making sure that those plans would work and figuring out how do we take this thing and turn it into a real actual thing that's useful and and what the you know the, the owners really expected and wanted um, and through that that led into me getting into software um, I worked for um, a Salesforce consulting company for a little while and, and really enjoyed putting together systems, processes, companies, sales teams, um, really enjoyed that. And that led to um, working for a company called InsideSales.com or they just rebranded their Zant now. Um, but that was really interesting. So in that specifically, their tools are designed around sales teams and sales ops teams specifically. Um, really trying to organize and structure sales rep stays, making sure pipelines are prioritized, forecasting, things like that. And I really enjoyed that. I got to work with a lot of um, big enterprise Fortune 500 companies. Um, got to restructure a bunch of sales organizations. And it was fascinating to me the way that sales organizations work in the systems of process, the tools. Um, and I really enjoyed that. But there was... I wasn't fully in operations at that point. I was doing best practice consulting and reorganization and structure, but um, very specific pieces of sales was involved with that. And the opportunity that I'm in now came up. It was a small startup company. I think they had about 30 employees at the time I came on. The whole business was being run out of spreadsheets and really came on to implement the systems and processes to help grow and scale the company and get them out of spreadsheets and turn them into a real significant company. Got it. So you talk about fresh lime, right? Yeah. Cool. And are you the first kind of operations resource there? Yes. Awesome. And how many sales reps at the moment? Uh, right now there are, I think there's 12. 12 sales reps and just you. And you, you're not just sales ops, right? You're strategy and operations. Correct. Yeah, I do finance, customer success, some marketing operations, kind of all of it. Got it. And do you report into the COO? Yes. Got it. Awesome. Um, I guess, yeah. And so you're now looking at all these various different departments and then you're just look. You, you're also, you have the view of the sales operations. How does your like the view of the different types of operations, like, do you see it's just the same thing or you're like, okay, today I'm going to look at sales operations. I have to focus on this. Like, how do you approach your day-to-day -day work? Uh, that's a good question. So, Obviously the teams are very different and the needs can be different, but one of the reasons why I enjoy doing so much is it's really the prospect and customer life cycle, right? And marketing, how are we targeting them? How are we getting in front of these people? How are we getting in, nurturing them, and then getting them over to sales, ensuring that they have a good experience there, right? The value proposition, messaging, and all that's accurate. And then handing them over to the customer success team for onboarding, value realization, and you know, long-term success. So it can be very different depending on where it is I'm working or what I'm working on, but I, I enjoy the life cycle of it beginning to end. So I enjoy that where some people like to be more targeted or focused depending on you know, how big the company is and the work you have to do. Got it. And I actually see that businesses are obviously shifting more to the revenue operation thing. Right. And 
I feel the advantage of that is like a consist, like more of a consistent journey for the customer, right? So you might have one amazing person in the business of sales operations. So like the sales process is like extremely slick, but then they get to success and it's just like a shambles. So this is why I like speaking to more general operations people because I assume then there's more consistency over the life cycle. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. I think I'm seeing really two different methodologies and how those operations teams are ran. Um, I, I, my personally, I, I like all of it rolling up through a revenue operations function and not, I've seen a lot of businesses that have a sales ops team that rolls up through sales ops, customer success through customer success, marketing through marketing. Um, but I think it can create to your point, a bit of a disjointed experience sometimes. And if those different teams don't know what they're doing when they're working in the same tools, they can potentially, you know, get in each other's ways or cause issues, you know, unknowingly. So I prefer having a revenue operations role or function and all of those sit in that team. They might work directly with sales or marketing or whoever it may be, but they're up through the operate operations organization. And I think to your point, it creates a streamlined experience. It helps with communication and collaboration, reporting, visibility, all of that. Got it. Um, so as we're moving away from spreadsheets, uh, what sales tech do you have in place right now? Uh, yeah. So, um, for our marketing, we use Modic and Pardot, um, as our marketing automation tools. We use Salesforce as our CRM and we use inside sales or rebranded to Zant, um, for our uh, sales cadence tools and, and a little bit of predictive intelligence as well. They're, they're really good at helping us score all the leads that we have coming in and figure out what to work. We use Zora for finance and our CPQ. And then we use a company called Certify for our e-sign and collecting payment methods through signatures. And then on the customer success side, we use Churn Zero. And then for reporting, we use Power BI, Microsoft Power BI, and a little bit of Clipfolio for dashboarding for sales. Got it. Awesome. Very like the, the very smooth listing of, of tech tools. It's like you rehearsed that. Um, I made a list. I didn't want to forget. <laughs> uh, okay. Now can we shift to looking directly at the sales team? Um, what are you doing right now to make these guys more productive? Oh, so we have reporting that we put in place. So we understand lead flow, right? Because we want to know how many leads have come in and how many of those go directly to sales as opposed to marketing. And by targeting the ones that go directly to sales, we can make sure they're being called, how many times they're being called, and that they're you know, actually being worked, right? Trying to reduce some of that friction between marketing and sales, but ensure that the sales team's getting at that. And for them specifically, we have reports that show their open opportunities and their pipeline and how long it's been since each one's been touched. Certain flags are raised if it's been too long since an opportunity was touched, and then also, which ones don't have a next scheduled event to try to keep them on task. And then reporting around cadence information. How many times are calling? Is it too many? Is it too few? What's the contact rate? Just trying to make sure that they're not over or under calling. Got it. So you're basically tracking almost you know, like everything you can about what these people are doing to ensure yeah. that nothing slips through the cracks. Yeah. And one of the main reasons for that, we have a lot of sources and we are, our business model is focused around partners um, and, and relationships there. So as partners are giving us things, we need to make sure that, you know, we're treating those valuably and making sure that that partnership is taken care of. And part of that's making sure that they get called and things like that. So really we kind of have two masters more or less the partners and the accountability there for what they're doing for us and then sales and that accountability to make sure that they're hitting their number and they have what they need to be successful. Got it. Um, I assume you, did you like implement Salesforce when you joined? Yeah. Yeah. I helped them purchase it and oversaw the implementation. Got it. Are you, and so I assume the data quality must be pretty good, right? If you've been managing it since it came in. That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> it's never great. And we have some unique struggles because we do have partners giving us leads. So we're getting thousands upon thousands of leads every single month from various sources. And because we focus in key verticals, there's overlap in a lot of those partners. So um, what I did, Tano, what I can within that is when a lead's created, I check the phone number. Um, 
we work with a lot of small local based service businesses. So like Steve's roofing or John's auto shop or whatever that may be. So we can't really use names to try to separate those out because there's a lot of Steve's roofings. Um, so the decision that we've made was around phone number. If somebody gets two different emails from two different people, they'll just ignore one of them or throw them in the trash. But if they get two different phone calls from two different sales reps in a five minute period, that can be quite intrusive. So we're, we're looking at phone numbers when they come in, we're checking that to see if they exist in the system. And then if we are, we're attaching that lead to the main lead, we're marking it as a duplicate. So it doesn't come through any of our reporting or for sales to call, but they have access to go find that lead through the master if they need to see notes or where it came from or information like that. Got it. And I assume you're able to have, I think you said 18 sales reps, right? At 12. 12. So I assume you're able to have like one-to-one -one relationships with these guys, right? So if you're trying to get them to do something new, you just, you just sit down with them or like, is there any other strategy you've used to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I work really closely with our head of sales um, and I'm in weekly meetings with the sales reps now. I'm just trying to make sure that we're on the same page as far as what they're doing. And then really, I like to take the role of, or, um, the underlying really focus of sales ops is to remove obstacles, right? You're here as a sales rep to do your job and there's certain obstacles to you doing your job. It could be lead flow. It could be data quality. It could be training, whatever that may be. And my job is to remove obstacles. It's not to get in there and structure your day entirely and tell you exactly what to do, but it's to say, how can you be most successful and then share that best practice across the organization and make sure that, you know, I remove any obstacles I'm able to remove within my role. Got it. Yeah. So on the micro level, it's like, how can you make this one person more productive? But then it doesn't really matter if you can make one person really productive, if you can't standardize that and then yeah. try and make everyone productive. And so that's, so, that, so for me, it's like your role has two parts, right? It's like the micro getting one person productive, but then also making sure that that tactic is scalable and repeatable across everybody. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And we have reports that review in those weekly ones and, um, the people that are doing really well, that's obvious. The ones that aren't, that's obvious as well. And then we're able to, at that point, understand on an individual level, what do you need to get across the line, right? Maybe it's more activity. Maybe it's training on a specific thing and then putting them together. Really, you know, rep A is really, really good at this thing. This is something you're struggling at. Let's have you sit with them for an hour, talk to them, listen to some of their calls. They can listen to a couple of your calls and see if we can get you guys together. Interesting. So peer to peer training slash learning. Yeah, I, I think it's a fallacy that management or ops has all the answers. A lot of times we need to have the most open minds, right? And I think those one on ones and teams are interesting times to meet with that because not everybody's great at the same thing. And some people have answers that you don't. So you have to put yourself in a position where you can find those answers and be open to you know, making pivots when you need to, but also at some point too, pivots aren't necessarily necessary. So trying to find that balance between, you know, are we missing something or are you missing something? So every episode we have, we pull out like one thing uh, and use it as a quote for the episode. I think we just found the quote and that is, it's a fallacy that managers slash operations have all the answers. I think that's so true. And we've never heard that before. Um, Awesome. Now, can we turn our focus to the sales forecasting process? Um, are you, I assume you're pretty involved with that. Yeah, I knew that you were going to ask this. So um, I'm currently in the process of building out a forecasting system and tool, but we don't currently have a, a real baked forecasting process that we use. It's been a pretty big gap, but over the last 18 months, the focus has been you know, getting Salesforce implemented, getting cadence in place, marketing spun up, customer success. So we have some basic stuff. We look at numbers and stuff, but we don't have a, a real system in place. Got it. So are you going to be looking to do that completely within Salesforce once you do get up and running? Um, that's a good question. So because we are a smaller company, cost is obviously important. Um, I've spent a significant amount of time around forecasting just in my time at InsideSales.com. So I have a pretty good feel for how it works and I know what I want. Um, in the last week I used Power BI, for example, um, to pull data out of Salesforce. And I looked at, you know, for the last 90 days, how many sales we have, what's the average life cycle, what's the average deal size by vertical. 
And then I have some basic forecasting now that says, here's our number for the month. Here's how many sales we have at the current, you know, in the last 90 day average, here's how many sales that we need to hit that number and then projecting where we're going to end at current rate. So I've got a little bit of that stuff right now, but not a lot. Got it. And so would you agree to a statement that when you are in the early stage of the business and you have other things to do, getting a forecasting process is not at the top of the priority. There are like other things that should, should be done first. Is that, would you agree? Oh, uh, um, it depends where I own end to end. It wasn't a priority for me and what we were trying to do. Um, so it really just depends if, if your company's heavily on, on trying to raise money and things like that, forecasting is a lot more important. It really just depends on the vision and goal of the executive team and aligning to that. Sure. Um, KPIs. Now you, you mentioned you did some consulting inside sales. So I assume you're pretty versed in different sales KPIs. Do you have a favorite sales KPI if you could only track one for the rest of your life? Oh goodness. Um, for me, uh, this is going to be controversial. I didn't know you're going to ask that question. I got a list of KPIs. If I had to pick a favorite one, um, Oh, it's going to be really controversial. I think I would say the contact rate by dial attempt. Just so Interesting. I know, I know that everything's being worked, but not overworked, right? The ADR's time is precious where they're great ADR functions, great business development functions, keep the AE teams humming. Right. And so making sure that we're not leaving money on the table, but also I've found leads in my system that reps have called a hundred times, right? Let's, it should never be calling anything that much. So all that wasted time, right? You could have pulled, you know, 10 or 15 demos out of that hundred phone calls if they did it right. Right. Just so I understand this. So contact rate by dial attempt. So does that mean you're tracking it for me making attempting a hundred dials by any getting contact with 10 people that I get 10%. Oh, um, no, sorry. It's, if I dial once, what percentage of those phone calls are answered? Twice, three times, four times. So we can figure out, you should be calling eight times and then moving on, right? Got it, so with it for the same contact? Yeah, yep. Interesting, and so then you can see, so either, either that to ensure that your reps are dialing enough times. Is that the yeah, point of right. Yeah, they're dialing enough times and they're not wasting time over calling. Interesting. Yeah, that is, I, I'm not sure if it's controversial, but we definitely never had that before. Um, and I'm pretty sure that people listening might not be tracking that. So I think that's super useful. Thank you, Stephen. Um, okay, final question. In your whole career, who has taught you the most about sales operations? So um, I worked with uh, a guy, his name was Mark Regan. So he was the COO at Inside Sales for a little while. Um, he moved on. He was the SVP of global sales ops for Facebook and their workplace for a little while. Um, he just moved on to another company, but um, he had a really interesting approach. It was a really data-driven approach. Like he took from the sale and he completely reverse engineered the whole sales process back to the number of leads that were received and the phone calls that were placed. And then he built dashboards that were all over the company that said, here's the number of leads that we need to hit our number this quarter. And then here's the number of phone calls ADRs need to make in order to qualify enough prospects to get to our AE team to close enough business. And those dashboards were all over and it was super fascinating. And I, I loved that analytical approach because I'm trying to remember there's a quote I heard, opinion against opinion, title wins, opinion against data, data wins. And so many businesses are run by opinions now, not data, which comes back to sales ops and management, not having all of the answers. So having a clear structure and reporting mechanism in place helps the business make right decisions. And that was a lesson that he really ingrained in me. So data beats opinion, but if you don't have data, then title beats opinion. Yeah. When opinion, opinion versus opinion title wins. Yeah. Opinion versus data, data wins. Got it. That's another quote. Um, I mean, that felt super interesting. So if I'm in marketing, I'm sitting there and I'm seeing a report, a dashboard in front of me saying that we need 500 leads this month. And then if I'm an SDR, I'm saying, okay, we need to call 200 people this month. Like, so everyone's aligned with the metrics that run through the funnel that third one needs what they need, knows what they need to do. Yeah, everybody knows what their part is. And that really helps as an organization to know, you know, without getting 
involved in everyone's business. Are you doing your part? Right. Mm -hmm. And what does it take? And then that tells you too, like, if it's too many calls per rep, we need more rep. If we can't afford more reps and there's, excuse me, something broken in our system, right? We don't close at a high enough rate or CAC's too high, whatever it may be. Got it. And that's, oh yeah. It's also going to like, not in a bad way, but add social pressure to people, right? If you're a, like in FDR and you're like, you've done less calls than everyone else on your team and the team's behind the goal, you're probably going to do it. Like to, so you don't face rejection from the social circle. Right. Right. Yeah, and that right can be there. that a lot of people frown on that type of visibility, but I, I think it's incredibly valuable because mm. if you are behind, it's going to do one or two things and it's become quite apparent, right? You're either going to realize that you're struggling and you want to make it work and you'll figure out how to make it work and you'll look for that help and you'll look to your managers and your teammates to remove those obstacles or you make excuses. You don't really want to do it. And it becomes quite clear that you're not the person for that job. Right. Right? And, and then you're out you're more. Yeah. You're more suited to. So Steven, do I see you walking around the office, checking all the numbers and checking people's attitude and then kicking them out if they're not magic? No, I'm sure you're not that I, harsh. I, as an operations role, and this is important, I own the numbers. So I own, well, I own the visibility of the numbers, making sure that each department has the data that it needs and the reports that it needs to make the decisions that are necessary to run it. But I'm not accountable for those numbers and I'm not the ones talking to the reps about them hitting their numbers or not. Got it. That's the distinction. Okay. Awesome. Well, I got a page full of notes. Here are the things that I liked. Um, I liked our little chat about consistency over the life cycle. And you can do that with a, a more off basically feeding into the revenue ops function. Um, the quote, it's a fallacy that management has all the answers. Um, contact rate by dial attempt to check that either people are reaching out enough or people are not, or people are wasting too much time um, reaching out too many times. And then finally, uh, like having data visible to the whole organization and that data will be opinion, but title will be title will win if it's opinion versus opinion. Steven, thank you so much for your time. That was a really great session. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.